proletariat, created by the breaking up of the bands of feudal retainers and by the forcible expropriation of the people from the soil. This free proletariat could not possibly be absorbed by the nascent manufacturers as fast as it was thrown upon the world. On the other hand, these men, suddenly dragged from their wanted mode of life, could not as suddenly adapt themselves to the discipline of their new condition. As we saw in the previous chapter, over the course of many years, people were driven from their lands and more communal ways of living, as they were instead pushed towards towns and cities and forced onto the labour market. However, vast amounts of the population fought back and resisted this imposition of becoming a waged labourer. Many people took to trying to create new ways of life outside of this domination, including begging, robbing or becoming travelling vagabonds. In this chapter, Marx now looks at the brutal violence that the rising capitalist class and the state used against these people in order to force them into becoming a labour force. While I advise you to read it for yourself, we see many examples from the hanging of hundreds of thousands of thieves, public executions, the removal of body parts of beggars, branding vagabonds with hot irons, the taking away of children, slavery, and various other violent punishments like whipping or forcing into chains for what was judged as a crime. The bourgeoisie, at its rise, wants and uses the power of the state to regulate wages, i.e. to force them within the limits suitable for surplus value making, to lengthen the working day and to keep the labourer himself in the normal degree of dependence. This is an essential element of the so-called primitive accumulation. Some important things to note here is that most of the punishments were handed down by the state. As the rising bourgeoisie fought for political dominance against the old landed aristocracy, they had to fight to gain the power of the state. This then allowed them to use the state's institutions, the government, parliament, the army and police, to enforce these laws. Interestingly, we also see how the state is used as a tool of class rule. As laws are passed that recognise theft or robbery to be a crime, but ignore the theft and robbery of people's common land by the bourgeoisie. We also see that during this early period, workers were able to demand higher prices for their wages, and the bourgeoisie used the state to force a maximum wage limit to prevent workers from doing so. However, as capitalism eventually progressed into a fully developed system, it no longer required the powers of the state to regulate wages, as, as we've seen throughout the book, the internal mechanism of capitalism allows it to regulate them itself. The advance of capitalist production develops a working class, which by education, tradition and habit, looks upon the requirements of that mode of production as self-evident natural laws. One other important point Marx makes in this chapter is that, as we see, during this early period, capitalism required extreme violence and force to ensure people became and continued to be a waged labour force. However, as capitalism became a fully developed system, it no longer required this type of violence, as the silent compulsions of economic relations instead ensure that people continue to produce and reproduce themselves as waged labourers. As we've seen throughout the book, our relationship to capitalism and its internal mechanisms now mean we have to work to eat, to have somewhere to live, to be able to afford just the simple things in life. There might not be the mass public executions, whippings or branding with hot iron anymore, but this doesn't mean the system isn't still just as violent. The violence just hides itself in a different form now. If you don't work, you can't survive. And this dependence also creates the illusion that capitalism is somehow natural or that there's no other alternative.